Well, Rich, we recently discussed Space Hunter, a movie that you loved as a little boy. Undress her. Slowly. And had not seen since, and I had never seen. Mm -hmm. And so we, we figured we'd do that again. We, we ruined your childhood, uh, another piece of your childhood with that experience. So we decided to watch Ice Pirates. Another movie that you loved as a kid, right? Yeah, that, that came up during our, our discussion for Space Hunter, didn't it? Ice Pirates? Yeah. yeah. Because it was, those are the two, Space Hunter and, and Ice Pirates. I, I don't know what, well, I know what it was. It was the robot in the movie, but I think I might have rented Ice Pirates from the store like four times when I was like five. Okay. I guess that's appropriate because this is a movie that partially feels like it was made by a five-year-old. <laughs> uh, I actually, I think I liked it a lot. After, after Space Hunter, I was worried that this would have aged really, really, really poorly. Instead, it only aged really poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I had, I, it was a world, I had never seen it before. Just yeah. like, just like Space Hunter. I had never seen this movie before. And it was like a whirlwind of emotions. I got lost in like, like an irony vortex <laughs> because the movie feels like, and I, did you do any research on it? Like you did for a, Space a Hunter? A little bit. This is not like, not like a tremendous amount of Ice right. Pirates information out so there. This is the same dynamic as Space Hunter where I just watched it for the first time and you rewatched it for the first time since a kid and did a little research on it. So I don't know the backstory of this movie, but it feels like a movie where either in late pre-production or maybe even in a shooting, they realized what everything looked like. Oh, these sets are bad. <laughs> these robot costumes are terrible. Fuck it. And everybody just started fucking around and they just self-sabotaged their movie for fun. MGM ran into a budget crisis, and the budget was slashed from 20 million to 8 million. Then that makes perfect sense. Yeah, because it, it, it feels like a movie. Like I can see that at one point this was meant to be like, oh, we're gonna do our own Star Wars ripoff. Like Roger Corman did a ton of those, and this feels like that was the kernel of the idea. But at, at some point, they completely went off the rails, and nobody cared. And uh, it, 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 by the end, which we'll get into that ending, it crescendos into complete anarchy and is almost brilliant <laughs> by the very end. Because it is, it's, I mean, starting with the lead actor. Uh, Robert, Rob, Robert Ulrich? Robert Urich. Urich, Urich, sorry. Who, TV guy, no, I guess? No, he, he, was, he was freaking Spencer for Hire. Well, that's TV, right? It's TV, but it was, wasn't like it wasn't like uh, he was a complete nobody. No, but he was mainly a TV actor, I think. By the I think, way, because, I think because Mike is in here, he started Spencer uh, for Hire with Avery Brooks. Oh, okay. Captain Benjamin Sisko. <laughs> I do have a Star Trek reference coming up, though. <gasps> oh my Actually, god! Actually, I'll do it right now. Go for it. Uh, his performance in this movie, and the only reason I think I even know his name is because he's name dropped in the Quentin Tarantino movie Death Proof. <laughs> Kurt Russell's character is a stuntman, and he mentions like, "Ah, I used to be Robert Urich's stunt double." <laughs> I think that's the only reason I know his name. Yeah, I did damn near the whole third season of Vegas. I was Robert Urich's driving double, and then Bob did another show, Gavilan. And he brought me with him on that till. But his performance in this movie goes along with the idea of everyone just saying, fuck it. It reminds me of the scene in Star Trek 09, the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, the Kobayashi Maru sequence, mm -hmm. where uh, Kirk is like fucked with the whole system, so he doesn't care. Two Klingon vessels have entered the neutral zone and are locking weapons on us. That's okay. That's okay? Yeah, don't worry about it. He's just like, yeah, whatever. And he's like eating an apple. This guy's performance is like that. He doesn't give a shit. Just have a lot of fun. And he's just, just like, the whole movie he's acting, it almost feels like he's acting sarcastically. Uh, he might be because, like I said, he, he was in a major TV show at the time and he knows he's in this movie that's gonna bomb <laughs> because the budget got slashed by, yeah. by more than half. How does that feel? A little snug. But and and Stephen, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, Stuart Raffle. And, and Stuart Raffle is is directing it. Though he didn't he didn't lay his biggest eggs at that point. 
Stuart Raffle? Stuart Raffle. No, uh, we mentioned this with uh, Space Hunter, but Stuart Raffle also directed Mac and Me, uh, Tammy and the T-Rex, and... Mannequin 2, on the move! The, the, the sequel to the famous film Mannequin, starring Andrew McCarthy, uh, and a mannequin that comes to life at night? Is that the plot? Well, they're two entirely different magical mannequins. I know the sequel has movies. nothing to do with the yeah, first no, one. The, yeah. the first one's an ancient Egyptian who gets turned into a work of art that also is a mannequin for some reason. Oh, no, wait, wait. She's different works of art through the years because artists keep making statues and her spirit inhabits them. <laughs> is that the plot? That was the plot of the first mannequin, <laughs> which I've seen. Because I, I'm weird. I saw it as a kid. I don't remember anything about it. And I think the second one, it was just some kind of medieval curse. And it wasn't even a mannequin. It was just like some ancient artwork that was touring around. Oh. Yeah. I need to watch it now, though, uh, after after catching up with Stuart Raffle's other films. Because I'm, I'm convinced he may be kind of a genius. In, in, the, in the realm of <laughs> fuck it movies. <laughs> movies where he's just like, screw it. Like, we don't have the budget. We're just going to do all sorts of dumb shit. Who has an idea? We're putting it in the movie. Jay, maybe he's trying really, really hard and he's just awful. Well, that's why I say I'm stuck in an irony <laughs> vortex with this movie. Because there's parts of it, it's it's overtly a comedy, unlike uh, Space Hunter, which is more of a well, straight... He, he, also wrote, he, he also rewrote the movie. He wanted to add more comedy. Okay. Hey, Bloods. Y'all want to pump some titties? <laughs> yeah. No. Hey, it's been a long time. Find his titties on Mithra. No, get the hell out of here. That makes sense then. Yeah. Because it feels like uh, it's a movie where it's the, the comedic voice is all over the place. There's stuff that's genuinely funny. There's stuff that's so stupid and bad it's funny. And, and then there's the robot. pure cringe. And then there's some cringe, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I mean, there's less than five minutes into the movie we get our first fart joke. <laughs> And then if you want us to, to like care about your protagonist, maybe in the first five minutes, don't have him lamenting the fact that he's not allowed to rape anymore. What happened to we rape, we pillage? Tell your highness she just slept with the finest moment of her life. Yeah. And that's one of those things where if, if they cared about the production, even if you're making a comedy, you know, you have to put thought into what you're doing uh, and you have to take it relatively seriously. And again, nobody cared. Robert Urich is just like, can I make a line where I'm upset that we don't rape and pillage anymore <laughs> and look down the dress of our, our female protagonist? Who's unconscious. Who's unconscious. <laughs> yeah. And then steal her unconscious body for really no reason. He just grabs her, right? He's infatuated with her. And that's what sets off the entire plot of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I at least like the twist where, you know, he tries to kidnap her and fails and then she ends up kidnapping him. Yeah, and that's kind of... I at least like that. Yeah, well, that's the thing, and that's their stuff like that, where that's genuinely kind of clever. Or the introduction of uh, John Matuzak, who we'll talk about, who's the thief. They get captured, they're in this little, you know, uh, cage, and he introduces himself as a thief, and he gives the... Uh, what's the black guy's name? He's a <sighs> kind of sidekick character. None of the names matter. Yeah, none of the names matter. But he, but he gives that guy, like, a gold necklace, and then it turns out that gold necklace is something he stole from someone else that's in the same cage... And then he gets out of the cage and the monks caught. Like, that's funny, a funny series of events. It, it was a great introduction to his character. And then he fades into the background. Yeah. Which was tragic, really. <laughs> he's the best part of the movie. Because when he walks out of the cage in that monk outfit, and you realize that he's cleverly got out of the situation he was in, I was excited to see more of that character. Oh, what else is he going to do? Nothing. Nothing, really. Nothing. It's a good spot. May I? You think you'd give me a sandwich or something? But John Matuzak, we should point out, most people know him as Sloth from the Goonies. Sloth? Sure. <laughs> but he was also a football player. He played for the Raiders, I believe. Yeah. Uh, from the Milwaukee area. He's, he died relatively young, and he's buried just south of Milwaukee in a cemetery. One of, like, three noteworthy Milwaukee graves. <laughs> Who are the other two? Patrick Cudahy <laughs> and... That's it, really. That's it, yeah. That's it. The guy is famous for bacon and sloth from the Goonies. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the guy is famous for bacon. He has a really big shrine, That's okay? true, that's true. 
Do you think his casket is made out of bacon? <laughs> yes. Or it was. It's it not was. there anymore. The worms got it. <laughs> this is claimed to be the world's first bacon themed coffin. It feels like Roger Corman made space balls, is what I kept thinking. Yeah. Yeah, there's parts that are like juvenile and immature silliness. There's genuinely clever stuff. There's, I actually liked that all the robots are just pathetic. Get in there. Go on, go, go, go. Oh, God. Because those costumes suck. They're so clearly foam. You see them like wrinkling up. They look awful. So the fact that they're just like terrible at everything and falling apart uh, is funny but then one of them shits oil and bolts, and you're like, oh, that's the five-year-old came in. Yeah. The director's son had an idea, and they put it in the movie. Because anyone that had an idea, eh, let's just throw it in the movie. It tells a coherent story. I know what happens in it. That's a plus in its book. Oh, sure. If this were a best of the worst film, I'd be all over that. It does have a coherent story. The movie's called Ice Pirates, which ultimately ends up having very little to do with anything. I oh, guess they, it, there's a nice little twist at the end, because uh, it takes place in a world where uh, water is like the most valuable commodity, and which is why our pirates go around and they steal. Which doesn't make much sense because there's a lot of water in the universe. Less, less liquid water, but there's like ice all over the fucking place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, did you ever see Tank Girl? No, I probably should. Because that's another movie that, where it's, yeah, water is super rare and valuable. And uh, the villain is uh, Malcolm McDowell. And he has like this little device that he'll he'll stab into someone's back and it sucks all the water out of the, the human body. <laughs> so then he just has jugs of water from that. Uh, but there, yeah, so the princess character, they, they kidnap her, but then she kind of holds them hostage to find her father. Yeah. Where's my father's ring? Ring? Huh. Ring. And I guess the twist at the end of the movie is that her father knows the location of Earth? They, they don't say it's Earth until the very end. No, that's the reveal, yeah. They're, they're, they're looking, he was looking for the seventh lost water world. Yeah. Which ends up being Earth, but I guess, I guess all of the planets that had water in it got like obliterated in some major war they had. That's, that's kind of neat. No, that's all the stuff, uh, that's the world building stuff that feels like that was in the script from the beginning when it was meant to be a serious sci-fi movie. And the fact that it has that blueprint, that framework uh, to go on is what holds the whole movie together where you just go off on silly tangents and introduce space herpes. Space herpy. Herpy. Which I thought that was gonna pay off and it really doesn't. It annoyed me to so much because they, they, kept, they kept calling back to it. Yeah. And you're like, well, this is gonna have a big payoff. Like, I, you know, like, because I didn't, I didn't, you know, I saw this when I was five and I have no recollection anymore of what happened. Right. I was expecting, like, you know, once they got into the time warp, like, this thing would be, like, fully grown now and it'd be, like, oh, a giant yeah. monster that would attack the bad guys and that, that would have saved the day. That would have been a good payoff. But it just dies. Yeah. Maybe that was, originally they had more plans for it and the budget didn't allow it. Like, they wanted oh, that, a big, a big space herpy monster or something. That which, could be. Which would have been fun. But like the, the, the end bit is they get into a time warp and they're, they're aging super fast while they're all fighting. Ah! Robots, attack! You all right? I think, good. I'm getting too old for this. Which is introduced earlier in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Set up some payoffs. <laughs> they didn't do it with the herpes, but they did it with this, yeah. Time warp. Lost 20 years in 20 seconds. Where, yeah, you, you get sucked in a time warp and you continue to age rapidly. And that's the climax of the movie. Might as well just go right into it. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about spoilers for the <laughs> Ice Pirates. The final 10 minutes of this movie are so ridiculous and wonderful <laughs> and full of so many absurd visuals. Because we have, I mean, there's absurd visuals through the whole movie. We have, as, as the movie goes along, their ship is like collecting other characters. And there's one shot where it's just like, this is ridiculous. It's past the princess's tea time, Percy. Grab a little bit. Yeah, put you on the workbench. Put those things over there. Yeah. Rest of you guys, keep going. Are we in trouble? With robots behind her and little warthogs and mules. And it's all on a spaceship. <laughs> and it's just so bizarre. 
and it just keeps accumulating. Like it, it just like stacks up on itself. So then those last 10 minutes happen. And that was my favorite visual was when the princess comes out of her room, they're stuck in the time warp and there's just a skeleton in the, uh, the maid costume. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny and horrific. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it was great. <laughs> and then it keeps building from there where it's like, oh, now uh, Jason is introduced to his son and his son's a baby. And then... And he's an asshole about it, too. It's like, that's not mine. Would you like to hold him? Uh, no, I've got some other problems I have to take care of. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> 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 And then the sun, and then the, you know, the, the time warp continues to the point where the sun is a grown adult, also played by your, your Robert Urich, and saves the day. Jason, it's him. It's, it's him. That's our baby. That is him. Half of his friends are dead of old age or getting killed by the, the villains. And if it had ended there, I would say it's one of the most brilliant endings of all time. But they kind of wimp out and then they, they reverse it all. We came through it. We're back to the exact moment we were at when we entered the time warp. If you cut off the last 30 seconds of this movie, it would have the most perfect ending in so, film history. So you would just end it with them being like 80 years old. Yes. Yeah. Robert, Robert Urich's uh, his own son. He's like, I saved the day, dad. Cut to credits. See, it, it wasn't, this movie wasn't daring enough to go there. Yeah. This movie is, Barely competent, but it's, I mean, it, it, it's competent, mm -hmm. but it, it just barely meets the threshold. Well, and like I said, it doesn't have a, a consistent kind of tone to it. It's it's just like throw everything at the wall and see what sticks as far as the uh, the type of humor. I blame the director of Mac and Me for that. I'm going to say, because I, when I was watching this, I was like, this is definitely directed by the guy who did Tammy and the T-Rex, because that's another kind of fuck it movie, which I don't think, we did that at Best of the Worst years ago. I don't think we knew the backstory to it at the time, but the backstory is he knew somebody that had a giant dinosaur robot that they were like, we're going to be moving this to another state in a couple weeks. Uh, do you want to use it for a movie? And so he just built a movie around this dinosaur robot over the course of like, I don't know, a month or something. Like he put it together super quick. And that's what another, that movie too is also just like, ah, whatever, tonally, it's all over the place. <laughs> Which is normally bad, but when you're making a movie that's all bad to begin with, I appreciate that level of anarchy. Uh, you like my blouse? I love that nobody's walking around a fucking forest preserve. Because no. So many fucking low budget science fiction movies do that. They either wander around the forest or they wander around in a desert. And everything is industrial except for that one Mad Max ripoff scene. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, they, uh, of course, they end up in the desert at one point. Apparently, Max von Sydow is in that scene somewhere. Is that the scene he's in? Because he I was, think so. He was listed in like like sometimes they show like the little I watched it on Amazon. They have like little people in this scene thing up in the corner when yeah. you pause it. And Max von Snyder showed up. I'm like, where the fuck is he? I thought he was gonna be like the old king or something. But... Yeah, I kept waiting for him to show up, and he didn't. So he's apparently as a cameo somewhere. I think it's in that desert scene. That's the sign of a good cameo when you can't even recognize the actor. <laughs> Maybe it was the guy on the toilet. <laughs> the he was the guy the in the movie. alien mask? <laughs> the guy in the alien mask. <laughs> I won an Academy Award. <laughs> you know what? He won an Academy Award. He can do what he wants. That's true. You doing some Ice Pirates film? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> well, is it Angelica Houston? Ron Perlman? I'll do it. Oh, yeah. Ron Perlman's in this film. One of his first, maybe. Did, it, did his jaw get bigger over time? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, his face almost looked normal in this. I was shocked it was Ron Perlman at first. Yeah. And Angelica Houston, I'm assuming she wasn't very famous at that point. I don't think so. Yeah. I feel like it was, I mean, she was in a lot of stuff, but I feel like it was like the Adams Family that kind of kind of blew her up. And she's someone in this movie that 
is not in on the joke. She plays this so serious. <laughs> And that's just, I, maybe that's just a testament to her as a, a serious actress. I don't know, but she does not seem like she's, she, she will not sanction this buffoonery. She doesn't do much. No. She, she has this really, you know, I mean, badass scene where she cuts somebody's head off. It's like they're trying to follow a formula because like a more standard like adventure film, the hero meets up with more and more people and you get a whole adventuring party that grows. But yeah, but here it starts with most of the party and then they disappear <laughs> and then they come back. And then they fade into the background. And then they don't have anything to do for the rest of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> and Angelica Houston, her costume too, looks more like it belongs in like Conan the Barbarian or something. Everyone else is wearing like pirate costumes or renaissance fair costumes well they to be fair they do kind of lean heavy into the fantasy aspect like the the bad guys the templars i mean they're they're just dressed like old-timey knights they even they even use swords and chain mail Mm -hmm. which i guess if you're making a a pirate movie in space i guess that makes sense but visually it looks weird yeah it looks wrong like i mean we get what you're doing with the swashbuckling stuff you don't need them to literally dress like pirates (laughs) <laughs> it, it was it was an early stab at a a fantasy themed science fiction film. I did like the the first big action scene, the first swashbuckling sword swashbuckling scene, it takes place in a tiny office. Like I thought that was funny. They're like cramped in this <laughs> tiny little room. I think that was intentionally funny. <laughs> I guess we got you, Peg. It's, I think it's weird that most of the action in general is awkwardly done by robots. Yeah. For people in costumes where they literally can't see. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's a lot of, the, the action in this movie is a lot of this. Yeah. Again, I, I think they, they knew they, did, they couldn't pull off good action, so let's just make it ridiculous. <laughs> I like the one robot that has a, he's got like a bolt right in the center of his chest and he pulls it out and just collapses. <laughs> yeah, it looks real good. Because you said you liked the movie because of the robot when you were a kid. Was it one of those robots? Do you even remember? There might have been one that I thought was the one robot throughout the entire film. Okay. I don't know, I was five. Because, yeah, I remember you mentioning that. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of robots. There's the one little, like, I guess it's a garbage can robot. No, is- I'm, I'm definitely thinking of the ones that were humanoid. Okay. Because... Uh, I really liked C-3PO when I was young. Golden Man. Because I remember calling him Golden Man. <laughs> I like Golden Man. He was, my, he was my favorite one. Did anyone ever correct you and tell you his actual name? He was a kid. Uh, Nobody gave a shit. My childhood, my childhood's just a blur. As it should be. I was fucked up by watching shit like the Ice Pirates. <laughs> you knew way too early about space herpes. You could tell how unsupervised I was when it came to the media I watched. (laughs) Richie's watching his space herpes film. (laughs) With the castration jokes. I was going to say, there is a whole scene (laughs) in this movie where they're on a wacky uh, uh, conveyor belt castration machine. Which goes into, I wanted to mention the, the sets in this movie, where so much of it is so clearly just, here's a location, we're going to do as little as possible to make it look sci-fi. They had a low budget and it's not a forest preserve. I'm gonna give them That's a true. lot of credit. The conveyor belt was distracting though because it was so clearly just a conveyor belt. <laughs> like if you've ever been on, on like a brewery tour, it just looked like that. But then they, yeah, they J- just Jay, put the people on it. This movie was made pre-hipsters. <laughs> Nobody went on brewery tours. <laughs> <laughs> this looked like a sci-fi this location. This just it looked design. like a sci-fi location. Maybe. It was fine. But there's a lot of that in this movie where all of them, like even the spaceship set almost looks like a lot of it was pre-existing. Everything looks so like we, we half finished it that we had to rush the movie into, into production. So all the sets look like they're just pre-existing locations that they maybe put some blinky lights in. And at one point, again, going along with the idea of fuck it, at one point they didn't even have a set and they said, just fill the room with fog. <laughs> I think that was a planet, Jay. That was just That a, was a planet that was just fog. That was a room in a warehouse <laughs> that they, they couldn't afford to build a set, so they just sprayed the whole thing down with fog. And part of the randomness, it was just Amazon warriors and unicorns. I, I mean, it's visual, it's, it's different. Visual, yeah, it was interesting. That's the thing, it's like the movie keeps 
you never never loses you never lose your attention because it's it's constantly jumping from one thing yeah, to the next. Like I said, they're not just in a forest preserve. You get yeah. you get you get the spaceships, obviously. You get some weird grungy industrial planets. You get fog planets. You get Amazon warriors. You get Mad Max land. That is interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing wasn't in the desert, so it was okay when they go there for one scene. But uh, uh, they, yeah, so the fog planet, they get introduced to the king or whatever he is. Besides, I couldn't exist without servants. Liquid. Do you know who that was? <sighs> uh, Robert Vlanch? Bruce Vlanch. Bruce Vlanch, yeah. Who I guess is most famous for writing jokes for the Oscars, right? Mm, yeah, so just Hollywood behind the scenes personality, yeah, writer. He was on Hollywood Squares. Hollywood, I remember he was on Hollywood Squares. Yeah. Oh my, oh yeah. Okay. Baby got back. Baby that, got front. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. I think I think it was the modern Hollywood Squares equivalent of Paul Lind. Though I say modern, that version was in the 80s and there's probably been two other versions of Hollywood Squares since <laughs> modern then. Modern for the time this movie was made. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that was supposed to be a cameo or at the time you say, "Hey, it's Bruce Valanche." I don't know, but the fact that he was just a severed head was fun. Let that be a lesson to I you. have a splitting headache. <laughs> I quite decide myself. I'm just I'm not sure why it was made at all. Star Wars. Oh yeah, Star Wars. Star Wars, I guess. I don't know whose concept the movie was. If the original script was meant to be more serious, I'm sure they were pretty pissed off with the final result. How does that feel? Perfect, madam, thank you. Good, step down and stand over there. Yes, ma'am. Do you, do you think when you're charging in with your $8 million budget that you're just gonna compete with Star Wars? No, that's why you hire Stuart Raffle and okay. say, turn it into a farce. So it's just sleazy, just just get as much as you can out of the popularity of this other thing. It's it's it, it's like Roger Corman mentality. This is what's popular. We're going to make lower budget equivalents of that. But they hired a guy that decided to make it all completely ridiculous. I don't uh, mean anything by this, but is there any particular reason why he's black? Sure. I wanted him to be perfect. It's very weird. It's Oops. it's one of the more memorable Star Wars ripoff movies because it's just so odd. It's like Spaceballs before Spaceballs time. Yeah, I saw, I, I kind of briefly looked at like IMDb user reviews and I saw a number, number of them that were like, this is a great spoof, this is a great satire. And I feel like they're being really generous in calling it a spoof because it's not really spoofing the genre. No. It's just a movie made in the mold of the genre that has lots of dumb jokes in it. Which is kind of a different thing. They're not like like playing on conventions or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, an alien farts once in a while. It's funny because that character's black. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh yeah, there was a the, the N word drops at one point. That, oh God, that was baffling because it's not like there's any sort of theme throughout the movie of racism. It, it's just all of a sudden. There is one line where it's, they're supposed to go through the conveyor belt castration machine and then they come out as like albino slaves. But when they're all lined up and they're trying to pick out which slave to go with. Well, I think we should take the black one, definitely. He'll go very well with the new wallpaper. I don't know what was intentional with this movie. I think that's the problem with that joke. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what was intentional. Yeah. <laughs> Do you notice the guy in that scene that's, that's showing off the, uh, the slaves? He's Ian Abercrombie. Who, he was the wizard in uh, Army of Darkness. He was Mr. Pip oh. on Seinfeld. That's why I got you the tighter ones. Don't forget about those. I, I can guarantee he was on Star Trek. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what Star Trek, but I know he was on it. Everyone was on Star Trek. There's no way he was not. <laughs> it happens when you have a show that's been on the air since 1963. That's I mean. true. That's true. Also, there was someone when they're standing there in their costumes between Robert Urich and the other dude. There's a woman uh, uh, slave behind them that I was almost convinced was Kristen Wiig, but there's no way it could be because she would have been a child at this point, but it looks identical to Kristen Wiig. <laughs> Does she have a, was her mother an extra? That, that could be. That could be. <laughs> Kristen Wiig's mother. See, Kristen Wiig's mother in Ice Pirates. <laughs> Top build. Top build. She's more famous than Robert Urich. <laughs> Well, her daughter is. That's good enough. Is everything okay? I'm afraid not, sir. 
So many weird things. So like, many weird choices. Like I said, this, this movie is almost good. <laughs> almost. It doesn't, doesn't quite get there. Yeah. I, I appreciate the level of, of self-sabotage. Of just, <laughs> we're going to try it all. And if the whole movie had the same kind of spirit of those last ten minutes, all the time warp stuff, uh, I think it would have been amazing. Go even crazier. Go even crazy. I mean, I appreciate, you can't do that through the whole movie. You have to build up to it. But there were parts early on where it's like, is this meant to be funny? Is this unintentionally funny? What are they going for? So it's a bit of a mixed bag, but man, those last 10 minutes make the whole thing worthwhile. It's, you know what, it's, it's, it's a relic, Jay. Because this is, this, is this is one 80s property that is never gonna be rebooted. <laughs> That's probably a pretty safe bet. Yeah, yeah there's, there's no need to reboot the Ice Pirates. Y'all want pumps of kitties? <laughs> yeah. I was, I was talking with, with Mike the other day. It's like something about our generation. We just, we, we can't let our childhoods die. St Star Wars, Robocop, Ghostbusters. What's the next version of that thing? Oh, yeah. There's a new He-Man cartoon coming out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like... Say what you want about boomers. No one's bitching about the most recent Howdy Doody reboot. <laughs> <laughs> they let their childhoods go. We're still playing with our action figures. That's because they, they, they grew into adults and our generation never did. <laughs> We're a generation of man children. <laughs> Except for Ice Pirates, we let that one go. Yeah. Yeah. And now we will let it go. Space Hunter and Ice Pirates are two two uh, properties that are guaranteed to never come back. No, these are this is good. These are these are ghosts from my childhood. I have now revisited them and I could I can let them go. Yeah. Yeah.